Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you, Mark. Uh, we share a common um, interest in lupins, but that's not been too successful, has it? <laughs> so anyway, I'd like to thank the GRDC, Dejik, and uh, you know, uh, you know, the what's the other one? Uh, G G Jiwa, Jiwa. Okay, it's hard to get all these names right. Um, for inviting me here today. Well, I suppose the question is, what, what am I doing here today? Am I getting in the way of you and your cold beer next door? I, I am. I'm the only person that's keeping you to get there. So I'll, I'll try to be brief. Um, but anyway, um, well, we've been buying Australian grains for a very long time, and uh, you know, oil seeds as well. And uh, we do appreciate the quality. But at the end of the day, I suppose uh, a lot will depend on competitiveness uh, in terms of cost and quality. So I, I try to address these issues today. Okay. So, um, so we are look, going to look at a competitive trade position of Australian wheat in Southeast Asia post deregulation. Then we're going to compare the quality of Australian wheat and wheat from other origins in Asian food products. Then we're going to look at the performance of this new varieties of prime heart. I'm, I'm not going to talk much about that because that's basically an Eastern thing. You, know, you guys are very far away from that. But I'll just give you a summary of that. And then we'll look at the potential using... Uh, well, that, I'm not going to talk about that as well because this is for the guys in the East. Because I'm going you know, tomorrow to the East to present something similar. And then we'll look at... What's happened? Okay. The potential of Australian canola, canola in Southeast Asia and the opportunities for the use of lupins in Asian foods and animal feeds, you know, one of my favourite subjects. And then we'll have some take-home messages. Okay, uh, this is a, you know, a, a map of Southeast Asia and Australia. What I've done, actually, is that uh, I've actually put in some distances. So you can see from here that, uh, you know, Singapore and Jakarta, Jakarta is actually closer to Perth than Brisbane is, for example. And, and, and Brisbane is very far away from Singapore. So actually, what it means is that you guys here are closer to us. And we have 500 million hungry mouths to feed. So you'll be better off you know, to do what the Scots are going to do soon, to break away from the United Kingdom <laughs> and join us. We've got much more people. You only have 20 million people, not many, right? In the East, you'll be better off with us. Okay. So now this is the, what we're trying to say here. Now, basically, you have 538 million people importing 16 million tons of wheat and consuming only 31 million uh, tons uh, kg per capita, compared to Australia with 23.4 million tons uh, pe million people, and you're consuming 270 kilos. So the potential, obviously, for increasing wheat uh, consumption is still there. But bearing in mind, we are rice-eating region, and therefore. Um, you know, perhaps uh, we won't eat, you know, eat as much uh, wheat as you, you would like us to do so. But again, to note is that we got almost half the number of people um, in Southeast Asia as in China. So, and we are eating a lot more than the Chinese are at this moment. Yeah? Okay. So, what are the advantages for wheat buyers post deregulation? Maybe we should address that. And, of course, there are more sellers in the market. But that may not be such a you know, good thing if you consider that most of the flour mills in the region were virtually married to the Australian wheat board for 20, 30, 40, 50 years. Suddenly they got divorced. And then you got all these you know, new sellers with very attractive uh, you know, packages. Right? So who do you uh, go with? Who do you date? You know? I mean, not, not all of them are nice people, you know, so, so it's not that necessarily a good thing when you have a lot of sellers that you, 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 you have to be, you know, able to distinguish between the good guys and the bad guys. And then, of course, because there are so much more uh, sellers, the price becomes more competitive. And then the free market principle applies. And so no special allocation to any buyer, uh, no discrimination for any buyer with smaller volumes. Uh, and, uh, sorry, I can't get this to work. Oh, the highest bidder gets the goods, and better contacts with farmers possible to do contract farming with special needs. You know, in the old days, of course, uh, no customer actually met up with any farmer here, but today you could if you wanted to. And uh, the disadvantages, 
Um, sometimes the price is not aligned with international markets due to local supply demand situation. Somebody is short and starts covering, you know, prices go up. Large quality fluctuations for containerized shipments, you know, that's, uh, we'll talk about that later. Less reliable supply, you know, the, the, you, know you don't have uh, sometimes uh, enough crop to, to the end of the year. A lot of selling takes place, you know, early in the season. And uh, there's no unified information on crop quality. Uh, and no technical support, you know. Uh, they used to train millers and all that, they don't do that anymore. Um, and so, post, so what's happened? So those are advantages and disadvantages. So what's happened? So what has happened actually is that the um, export of Australian wheat has gone up post deregulation. Okay, it's partly because you guys are producing more, but the next chart shows that most of the increase is going to Asia post deregulation. Okay, the Middle East, uh, Africa, they have either remained the same or gone down but there's a very steep increase to Asia, especially Southeast Asia, okay? And significantly, the Southeast Asian uh, wheat imports are also favoring the Australian wheat. So you can see that the Canadians, US, and other origin wheat have either remained about the same or gone down, while Australian wheat imports have gone up. Don't worry about the 12, 13, that, that figure is only for Nine months or something like this, yeah. Sorry. Mm. Okay, I think I've gone, um, have I gone too much forward? Okay, now what has also happened is that the number of consignees have increased dramatically. So you are doubling or more the number of consignees or buyers you have. And this is partly because the the container wheat shipments have gone up and stabilized at around 2 to 2.5 million tons. So, you know, smaller mills usually buying containers. Now, however, uh, obviously, uh, you know, there is uh, dark clouds on the horizon and the Black Sea, you know, black clouds, okay? Um, and the Black Sea has been increasing the exports of wheat and, you know, it can be very much, uh, it, it can be 40 million tons, which is almost double what Australia actually exports. And you can see last year, uh, Russia and Ukraine alone increased their exports by 10 million tons. Okay? So that's a major area of competition. Now, this chart actually explains almost everything that I've put forth before. Now, this chart shows you. Or oh, maybe I should go here. Oh, not here. Okay, I'll oh, do it here. Now, this chart shows you the bulk freight rates from Australia to Southeast Asia compared with Canada, US, and the Black Sea. So, actually, what is making Australian wheat competitive in bulk is that the freight rates are about ooh, 25, 30 US dollars cheaper than North America and, you know, 50 over dollars cheaper than the Black Sea. So that is actually, uh, you know, keeping your wheat competitive because of the freight spreads, right? But if you look at container freights, it's the same trend exists. Uh, so it's about $40 here, and the US and Canada is about $70 to $75. And, but look at the Ukraine and the Black Sea area, it's down to about $40, well, $5. So basically, you only have a $15 advantage in freight spread. Now, is that enough to keep the black seed wheat away from you? Let's see. Okay, so this chart shows, uh, this is our own data, okay, which we collect. So if you look at, I know it's a bit noisy, but if you look at this chart in bulk here, and if you look at the black sea wheat uh, in red, it's, you know, it's trading a little cheaper then the DNS, this is the high protein. Yeah? These are the, what they call 14.5 or 15% uh, dry basis, uh, black sea wheat, Kazakh, you know, Russian, Ukraine. So that wheat trades a little cheaper than the DNS, which is expensive, CWRS, and uh, in, in, because last year we only had Prime Heart 12, uh, so it trades a little, uh, at a little discount. But look what happens when it comes in containers suddenly the black sea wheat discounts you know, Australian wheat 
by, well, in this case, it will be about $30 a ton. Okay? And significantly, it's also cheaper than in bulk. That means you could buy containerized uh, wheat from the Black Sea cheaper than you could buy Australian wheat in bulk. Okay? So that, that is where the competition is coming from. Containerized shipments of wheat from the Black Sea is significantly cheaper than similar shipments from the rest of the world. So this is uh, for the medium protein wheat, for APW. So if you compare in bulk, well, the APW is sort of like plus minus the Black Sea wheat, okay? Uh, but if you look at container shipments, uh, there you see that it can discount by up to 50 US dollars a ton. And that is a very big number, okay? And significantly, the container, uh, uh, Black Sea wheat in containers is also discounting Australian, uh, 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 you know, APW wheat in bulk. So this is where the reason why we are seeing this huge increase in Black Sea wheats coming into the region. Okay, so we also had some problems with quality since deregulation. So we had stones, we had uh, foreign matter, and then we had a lot of variation from container to container, and then we have a lot of foreign seeds as well. So this is, you know, because I suppose a lot of it is loaded straight off the farm, and there's not really a lot of quality control, and the aqueous people are not really there, so that kind of thing. And we also had a problem with wheat classification. Because we are not sure when we receive what we think is prime hard wheat. Is it prime hard or a strain hard wheat, especially from New South Wales, okay, which both varieties are being grown? Because there's no way for us to ascertain which variety is which. And occasionally, there are shortages of containers and container loading facilities. So now we come to the competitiveness of Australian wheat with wheats from other origins in Asian food products. So basically, this is just a rough a guide to the proportion of uh, you know, various types of food. So bread is about 20%, noodles is about 26%, and then the general purpose flour is a bit distorted in Malaysia because it's subsidized by government. So a lot actually goes into noodles and, 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 and you know, other kinds of food products. The biscuit is about 10% and the steamed bread is about 6%, but a lot of the general purpose flour is actually being used for that because of the subsidy by the government. Okay? So basically, we'll look at uh, the you know, performance of strained wheat and other wheats in noodles, uh, white bread and buns and cracker biscuits and merry biscuits and steamed bread, to give you some idea. So basically, what you need for noodles is obviously a bright yellow noodle. You don't want to do a dull or dark colored noodle. You need good quality gluten with high viscosity for firm and elastic noodles. You need fast gluten development for easier processing and good color stability for the you know, fresh noodles and high falling number and low enzyme activity for non-sticky noodles or longer shelf life. So, you know, it's, I, we don't have time to go through this, but basically what it means is the, the ABW performed the best. Uh, the, the, uh, the CPS white, you know, which is a Canadian uh, uh, Paris Spring white, performed equally well. And of course the red wheats uh, don't perform well. So you can see the red wheats were darker and didn't perform well. So, uh, so basically what it shows here is that uh, white wheat is preferred for this kind of product and the uh, ABW is the ideal wheat for this. Uh, so in summary, uh, when it comes to noodles, uh, the Australian prime hard and hard wheat are good. The ABW is good. The ASW is a bit soft, so it's acceptable. The other wheats are Indian, Pakistan, Russian, Ukraine, hard wheat winter and uh, Canadian uh, uh, Western rate, rates, uh, white spring can also be good. So Australian wheat is a preferred wheat for noodles in the region. Uh, then for bread, uh, the situation is slightly different. We, we need a high water absorption for better processing and higher yields, and uh, good quality gluten for better sponge tolerances and oven spring, short mixing time for good mixing tolerances, good gas retention to give a good volume, and soft eating quality for better shelf life. Now, in this aspect, uh, Australian wheat, normally the uh, hard wheat or prime hard, did, doesn't do so well. But this was unique to last year, where we only could get hard wheat 12 in real, you know, economically. And in that case, uh, you know, the DNS of, and the CWRS uh, obviously were better 
the DNS overall was better uh, than the AH, which is about the same as the Kazakh, uh, you know, high protein wheat, and the Russian was the worst. But the performance actually of the, the Kazakh wheat was not bad. Now, so overall, over the years, uh, we say that Australian prime heart can be good. There are times where we have got Australian prime heart that work almost as well as spring wheat, and the heart wheat is acceptable. Uh, you know, the CWRS is good, the DNS is good, and all the black sea wheat is acceptable, not too good. And when it comes to biscuits, uh, we require extensible dough. We require strong gluten for good fermentation tolerance for the cracker production. Fast hydration rate, short mixing time, produce a light, flaky, and crispy biscuit. And uh, this is crackers. And you can see in this case, um, the spring wheats uh, show better puffiness. Uh, and and uh, you know, and this, the, this is Canadian Western Hard White Spring. And the CWRS provide better eating quality. And the biscuit is more flaky and crispy. So overall, the Canadian spring wheat perform better. Uh, than the DNS and the uh, ABW uh, a, sorry, Prime Heart 13 is not really very suitable for making crackers. It's a bit hard and it doesn't puff well. And overall, for cracker, uh, you know, uh, the spring wheat's uh, the best, the, Austra uh, the Canadian and the US, while the Australian wheat and the black sea wheats are acceptable. And for Mary biscuits, um, this is where the black sea wheat actually performs better than Australian wheat. It has better puffiness, a crispier and looser texture when compared to ASW and APW. And you can see that the APW and uh, Canadian uh, Perry Spring wheat were actually acceptable. The ASW sometimes is not bad for Mary biscuits, and the Russian and the Ukrainian wheats were actually doing well, and the Indian wheat is, is okay. And for steamed bread, what we need is a bright white coloured product with good symmetry and shape, good water absorption for easy processing, soft and springy eating quality. And this is uh, typical of what happens. The ABW gives a very nice shape and colour, and, and eating quality is very good. The Indian wheat is bad shape and is bad crumb and is not good eating quality. The Ukraine and the Russians can give the shape, but not the colour, right? So, in, in summary, the, the ABW is better than the Russian and the Ukraine wheat, and the Indian wheat is not suitable. So this is one area, you know, uh, Australian wheat has an advantage. And overall, the ABW performed very well in, uh, you know, in steamed bread, and the ASW, uh, Russian and U Ukraine wheat were all right, but the Indian wheat is not acceptable. So th this is a varieties developed, um, you know, you see the problem is that uh, if you look at Southeast Asia, most of the spring wheat, uh, sorry, most of the wheat that's uh, imported for bread making are spring wheat from North America. And the reason is they need a strong fermentation tolerance because of the sponge and dough method that predominates in Southeast Asia. So I think the people out east has been trying to uh, develop, you know, a prime heart that could be as good or better than the spring wheat, you know, the great white hope issue here. So um, after many attempts, they've come up with this new one, and I don't want to go through this because you guys don't have this here. I just quickly, perhaps, and we did a lot of comparison. These are for the guys out east. Um, well, this one shows that the, you know, the, the, the new APH13 doesn't have the strength in the fermentation. After four hours, it got a bit rough on the surface with gas bubbles. So it's just sort of like starting to ferment too much. Um, well, the bread was okay, but anyway, just and then we, we did a 50-50, it was fine. Then we, we compared, now this was interesting, we compared the Kitman, the new varieties, with the normal prime heart and heart wheat, which we got from, uh, you know, our prime heart we got from Brisbane and Sydney. And surprisingly, uh, you know, besides DNS, the prime heart wheat from uh, Sydney and Brisbane actually performed better than the Kitman and the and the Canadian spring wheat. So you can see here, you know, uh, this is a, a no time though. But anyway, just to the findings were that DN, DNS gave the best water absorption and sponge tolerance. The APH from uh, Sydney and Brisbane have similar oven spring to the DNS and are better than CWRS and APH Kitman. All C, Australian Prime Heart gave a 
brighter and finer crumb structure than CWRS and DNS. What it means is that there are already varieties which are probably suitable uh, to replace spring wheat to a very large extent. It's just that you, know, you need to look for it. Okay, so in summary, Australian wheat performs well in noodles and biscuits when compared with Canadian, US and wheats from other origins. Um, however, the new Canadian hard white wheat uh, also perform well in noodle and biscuits and can be competitive against medium and high protein Australian wheat. But they don't have much acreage of that. But if they did, I think it's, it could be a competitor. And, um, sorry. The Canadian and US spring wheat perform better than Australian prime hard and AH wheat in bread products due to the predominance of the sponge and dough method in the region. Uh, the new varieties of APH Kipman and Gascon developed for sponge and dough bread making shows positive performance when compared to CWRS and DNS. However, the water absorption and sponge tolerance needs to be improved. And uh, US wheat is perceived as inconsistent in quality, but traditionally is used in the Philippines because of the, U the influence of the US there. And in Thailand, they use your aquaculture because they need a lot of gluten in, very strong gluten in those uh, applications. And since deregulation, we have encountered quality problems and inconsistency when buying Australian wheat in containers. And uh, medium and lower protein black sea wheat can, be partial, can partially replace ASW and APW in biscuits, noodles and steamed bread. Uh, higher protein black sea wheat can partially replace APH, AH and even North American spring wheat in bread. India and Pakistan wheat can partially replace APW, ASW and is available at competitive prices but their quality is not preferred. Sorry. However, Asian buyers still pay a premium for Australian, uh, for a APW and ASW. The question is, for, is how much and for how long. Okay. okay, recommendations to improve Australian wheat competitiveness. I think we need a consolidated crop report to make you know, available to all buyers of Australian wheat, you know, so that we know uh, in detail, like the old days, you know, what wheat is available where and what quality. We have, I think it's good to have a centralised export quality inspection system like, like the FGIS and Canadian Grain Commission, especially for containerised shipments because aqueous don't turn up at containerised uh, shipment inspections and you know, obviously a lot of things can happen. Make available a technical support centre for customers and growers to research into varieties suitable for customers' requirements. Obviously, you know, it's good we work together. Yeah? And, um, Improve inland logistics to reduce logistic costs of moving wheat into export facilities. I just learned this morning it costs $58 to move uh, wheat from WA farms into you know, export facilities and $70 average in the east. And normally, you know, the prices of wheat we buy, CNF, is about $100 US higher than your ex-farm price. So obviously somebody is making a lot of money in that, that value chain. <laughs> You, you, you better be a trained uh, you know, owner, things better. Okay, improve port logistics at WA to increase export capacity. Uh, and um, okay, so that, that is uh, all I have for weed. So I'm not going to talk about soybeans because you don't have soybeans here. But I just want to show you that 3.5 million tons of soybeans are imported for food purposes in, uh, in Southeast Asia alone. So if you could grow soybeans, you want to be in that. A market. Okay. So actually, Australian soybeans performed quite well from our research. Sorry. Okay. All right. So the next is about potential for Australian canola in Southeast Asia. Now, I'm not going to talk about canola oil. That is increasing. In fact, um, um, Southeast Asia imports probably something like 20,000 tons a month of canola oil and rapeseed oil of low uh, uricic acid. So there's a tremendous market for canola oil, and most of it is imported from Australia or Europe or somewhere. Um, okay, and, th and this is encouraging because the production is going up. Domestic consumption is obviously not going up much, and export is going up. You, you, you know, last year, you exported something like 3.5 million tons of canola. So, and in, in WA today, it constitutes 10% of your, you know, of your crops. Now, this is a chart of the consumption of uh, oilseed meals. Um, so basically, soybean meal obviously today is dominating 60% of the market for you know, oilseed meals. But canola and rapeseed meals at 12.5, from up from 10, uh, you know, 10%, uh, 
about uh, 20 years ago, and uh, and is you know significantly replacing uh, other types of meal. So canola meal has a potential, and and as you know, um, feed grain and you know protein meal consumption is going up much faster than grain consumption is in Asia in general. Okay, so this is an important part. The problem with canola meal is that metabolizable energy is lower than soybean meal. And it has about 10% lower digestible amino acids, and partly it's due to more extreme processing conditions. The high fiber content, as commercial dehulling is not successful, unlike soybeans, which is mainly dehull. Uh, high methionine, but lower lysine, that's good because poultry essentially needs methionine, uh, it's limiting in methionine. Uh, limitations on the use in poultry feeds due to high fiber content and sometimes high glucosinates. That doesn't apply to Australia, but cert certain European origins can have high glucosinate contents. And better processing of canola milk can result in better uh, broiler performance. We just want to show you uh, what we have done. We have actually um, processed uh, canola in what we think is a better way. And um, basically we did a trial uh, comparing it with uh, sovereign extracted canola milk from Australia and uh, from Dubai, which is basically from Canadian or European canola meal. And uh, we did, uh, uh, this is broiler chickens. So basically, uh, you know, I don't want to go through the details here. But this, this chart shows uh, that uh, this is the goal, this is the standard. So the standard, that means the growth, uh, the weight was supposed to be 2001. Now, all the canola meals did very well. The control was soybean meal. Uh, there was no significant difference. Okay, sorry. Okay, there were no significant difference in weight gain between the control and the canola meal diets, but in terms of feed conversion ratio, which is m more important, uh, there was a significant difference between the control, which is soybean meal, and which was similar to our canola meal, and the Australian and the Dubai canola meal at higher uh, feed conversion ratio. So what it means is that you can improve the quality of canola meal with better processing, and the performance can be similar uh, to soybean meal. So basically, our canola meal performed the best um, and is similar to the control diet with soybean meal. And therefore, with proper processing, nutrient availability of canola meal can be improved. Longer term, a commercial dehulling process for canola must be developed if poultry feeding is the main objective. Of course, you know most of the growth in, um, in, in meat consumption in Asia has been poultry and, uh, and swine. Now, this is uh, my favorite topic, and I'm in the right place to talk about this. <laughs> okay, opportunities for the use of lupins in Asian food and animal feed. Now, this shows you, this is a bit obsolete, but there's a tremendous amount of soybeans being imported, right? And a lot of soybean meal, okay? And um, basically, 3.5 million tons are actually used for food purposes in Southeast Asia alone. And, and this is an old chart, but it shows you that soybean consumption has gone up so much more than corn, wheat, you know, or uh, cotton or rice. So this is because of increasing in meat consumption in Asia, okay? That's driving this. And, and you can see that the, you know, the size of the feed market is huge. Of course, China is about 46%, but you know, there are significant uh, volumes in Thailand, you know, in Japan, Indonesia, India. So, Feed consumption is actually very big. Now, unfortunately, lupins have not been consistent in Australia. So you can see that over the years, the production has gone up and down, and uh, export availability has gone up and down. And people don't like to use it for one year and not another year. So for it to be successful, you need to have consistent supply of lupins. And the potential use of lupins in Asian foods. Now, I, I just want to point out that last year, end of last year, the World Health Organization had a global NCD, non-communicable disease action plan, which was supposed to be for the next seven years. And basically what this plan wants to do is to reduce the incidence of um, NCDs by 25% uh, by the year 2025. So we're talking about cancers, diabetes, cardiovascular diseases, chronic respiratory diseases, okay? And this is more or less the plan, but the first one is the most important, a 25% reduction in overall mortal mortality and from cardiovascular disease, cancer, diabetes, and chronic respiratory disease. Now, why is this important? Uh, because uh, lupins 
have uh, you know, nutraceutical properties of, ab of being able to reduce the postprandial blood sugar levels. Okay? And this many trials have been conducted in Australia, and it also, uh, I think, can uh, reduce, uh, increase, uh, so we say, uh, increase, uh, decrease appetite, satiety increase, uh, and then it can also reduce uh, uh, LDL cholesterol, and, uh, and it can also help with uh, bowel health. So it has a lot of nutraceutical uh, properties, which can be, um, you know, obviously, if quantified, can be eventually, um, uh, shall we say, labelled as such. But that's, that's another issue, yeah. So I think Mark here has done a lot of work on, uh, and his team, yeah, on his team, has done a lot of work on soya milk, tofu, miso, soyu, and tempeh, replacing uh, soya beans with uh, lupins. And we have done a lot of research as well, uh, using lupin flour and fiber in Asian food products, such as instant noodles, crackers, biscuits, and sausages. So in the case of instant noodle, we, we use about 6.8% of uh, lupin flour and about 1.7% of lupin fiber. And the noodles were evaluated for appearance, eating quality, oil, and protein content as well as to compare and control. And I don't want to go into details here. Uh, a, a, comp a company has actually made commercial samples of this and they may go into commercial production. Uh, you can see that the lupin um, noodle actually had a brighter and more yellow color. Of course, you can see tremendous increase in uh, dietary fiber content, yeah? Or, you know, with, uh, you know, compared to control, even up to 8.8%. Uh, and, uh, you know, protein also went up a little bit. And the commercial samples same, showed the same trend. So basically what happened was that by using lupin flour and fiber, we can increase the dietary fiber content by 65 to 105 percent, increase the protein level by 14 to 21 percent. The noodles appear more yellow than the control, and it had better soaking tolerance and eating quality. So functionally, it actually worked better as well. And we could also you know, use it in biscuits, you know, like crackers, and we can put in 5.8 percent of lupin flour and 1.5 percent of fiber. We can increase the dietary fiber to 7% and the protein to 127 So you can increase the fiber by 125%, you, you know, a little bit of protein increment. And there's no difference in appearance or eating quality. So essentially, the eating quality remains the same. And we can also make bread uh, to increase the, the, the fiber of bread and protein. But um, the crumb is a bit yellow, so that might be you know, a detriment to the product, but we, we don't know yet. Nobody's actually tried, tried it in commercial production in Malaysia, but it can be done. And uh, we also use it as a meat extender, compare it with uh, soya bean, uh, soya flour, and, uh, and you can see that uh, it actually performed very well at 5%, and it had significantly higher moisture after cooking compared to control, indistinguishable uh, taste from control and sausage using soya fiber, flour, no shrinkage was observed you know, after cooking, and, but the color was a bit darker. And in animal feeding, we actually um, had a lot of success. We made a special pre-emulsified full-fat lupins that had, uh, sorry, um, they had up to, um, you know, 15% um, oil. We had in oil in some emulsifiers, and protein was 35. We dehoused it. And, uh, you know, just to give you an idea, it, was, it had a quite a high um, ME of about 13.6 megajoule, and the protein was 36. And we did a feeding trial, uh, compared it with uh, uh, Dihao soybean meal with palm oil, and we used 5, 10, and 15% of this product. So, um, and basically what this shows is that um, uh, when we use it at 15%, we had the lowest uh, feed conversion, uh, and the weight gains were not significantly different. So what, what it means is that it, it, the product can replace soybean meal, dehouse soybean meal, and palm oil in poultry diets, which is, of course, very, very good. And it seems to work better as um, the quantity goes up. So no significant difference in body weight gain, body, uh, vital body weight, or FCR among all the diets. Um, but numerically, the birds fat 10% of full fat lupin had the highest body weight gain. And those fat 5% had the lowest. And uh, the full fat lupin usage did not have negative in effect on feed intake. And the treatments all had good livability. 
and normal feces because normally they are supposed to have sticky feces. We didn't in our case. And uh, we could use it up to 15% with, you know, without any impact on the growth performance. And there were, we also did a, a, a pig feeding trial, replacing 75% of soybean meal with a Dihau uh, lupin product. And basically, you know, this was done at the University of Malaya. Um, and we used 60 pigs and for 56 days. And uh, so basically, we measured the average daily gain, average daily feed intake, feed conversion ratios. And you know, uh, what it means is here is that uh, the, the initial body weight, total weight gain and final weight gain was not statistically significantly different. But the feed intake and feed conversion ratio for the pigs offered the, the lupin diet was significantly lower by 13.6%. So it means that the piglets or the pigs were doing very well when the, you know, when replaced, uh, when the 75% of the soybean meal was replaced with Dihau lupin meal. Okay, so what are issues or use of lupins in Asian food and feed? The supply has not been consistent, and this is probably the biggest problem. Although research has been done uh, with lupins replacing soya beans in to tofu and soya milk, but in reality, the Asian consumers cannot accept the difference in taste. They, they just don't find lupin milk uh, and tofu similar to soya milk and tofu. This, this is the problem. Uh, lupins have to create its own niche instead of just replacing soybeans in Asian food products. No health claims on, are allowed for lupins at the moment, so you need to work on that. If the FDA doesn't allow any claims, you could put it, couldn't put it on the label. Uh, the potential use of lupins in aquaculture, poultry and swine feeding is tremendous, obviously. Yeah? Uh, effective use in aquaculture and, and poultry and swine, lupins should be dehal, which is also obvious. Okay, New opportunities for lupins. Now, almost all the soybeans grown in the US and Brazil today are GMO, but a lot of consumers cannot accept GMO, and therefore lupins are non-GMO and can be cost-effective non-GMO replacement for soybeans. Now, in feed, like for example, I think uh, the aqua feed producers in Australia have changed almost exclusively to using dihau lupin meal instead of soybean meal 10 years ago. Okay, so what are the take-home messages? So Australian wheat, is more competitive in Southeast Asia post deregulation and containerized shipments have increased. Quality of Australian wheat in containerized shipments has deteriorated post deregulation. Black Sea wheat can be competitive in quality and their prices can discount Australian wheat by up to 50 US dollars per metric ton at certain times of the season. Australian canola has the potential to satisfy the increasing demand for a canola oil and meal in Southeast Asia, but has to compete again with Black Sea canola at certain times of the year. Sometimes, you know, the Black Sea canola can be 50 to maybe $80 cheaper than Australian canola. And certain varieties of Australian soya beans can perform well in soya milk and tofu when compared to American and uh, Canadian soya beans. With the WHO's current program for reducing non-communicable disease by 25% by 2025, lupins have a potential to be incorporated into Asian food products. The how lupin meal can replace soybean meal in aqua, poultry, and swine feeding. And thank you very much. Thanks for that address. Um, you talked about the acceptability of G or non acceptance of GM soy yes. in many of your markets. Any comment about GM canola? In canola, yes. Um, technically, canola, uh, the main product from canola is oil. Right? And most countries exempt the oil from GM labeling because you don't really have genetic material in oil, do you? So I think for canola, it would not be so serious as for soya, okay? Because of, you know, the oil is 42% instead of 20%. But again, um, the Euro Europeans don't accept that, yeah? They are still, you know, insisting that irrespective uh, whether it has genetic material or not, uh, you, know, could, you know, canola oil from genetic canola must be classified as GMO. So uh, that, that is still a very confusing issue, but most countries are exempted, including Malaysia. Um, today, several speakers, including yourself, have touched on the issue of uh, competitiveness of wheat out of the uh, Black Sea region mm -hmm. into Southeast Asia. We've, we've been talking about um, current quality and, and volumes, no one's really dwelt on the issue of where, where black sea quality is going moving forward. 
do you perceive that, that the Black Sea region is moving to, to improve quality? And if they are, at what point do you think they'll match West Australian quality regime with wheat? Yeah, I, I think the question is about the quality and competitiveness of Black Sea wheat. Well, um, I think the Black Sea is just like any country, you know. There are reliable suppliers and not so reliable suppliers. And the secret always will be to uh, look for the suppliers which are reliable. And, uh, you know, um, and, but generally, if we look at the last five years, I would say the quality of black sea wheat has improved significantly, okay? And uh, in a good year, um, depending on what you use it for, let's say we use it for biscuits, uh, let's say, you know, Mary biscuits, it would actually perform better than APW. But in noodles, by virtue of it being a, a red wheat, it would not be performing so well. Of course, the high-protein uh, black sea wheat, like Kazakh in particular, Luthania, and to a certain extent, Russian high-protein wheats, can perform reasonably well in bread. And we can use it up to, say, 30% as a filler without issues. Dr. Soon, thank you very much for your presentation. It's Alan Meldrum from Pulse Australia speaking. I'd like to ask you a question about um, protein content in lupins. You said that lupins have a tremendous potential mm -hmm. In, in the markets you described in Malaysia, mm. and that's at an average protein content of around 30%. But there's potential there for lupin varieties that uh, we can breed in Australia to have a higher protein content. Is that going to be significant, or is the average protein content of current lupins enough for what you're looking for? Okay. Um, I think generally the higher the protein, the better. And obviously, the less how, the better. So if you look at lupins, I would say the best lupin is a yellow lupin, which unfortunately I think the aphids, you know, the insects like it just as much, and uh, so it's not very popular here. Uh, the Augustophorus lupins, which are grown here mainly, are probably the lowest in protein and oil content. Um, the Albus lupin, which is grown in the east, had generally had higher oil content and higher protein, and you know, and of course, higher protein and higher oil content is preferred in animal feed. But I'm not sure about the economics of this, you know, whether uh, Albus would grow well here. But if you could grow Albus, it would be better than, you know, the, or the white lupin, it's better than the Augustophorus, the speckled one. And if you could grow the yellow lupins, which proteins can go up to 40% after dehulling, uh, there would be a real, I think yellow lupins with about 40 to 42% protein after dehulling can potentially replace soybean meal in many, many applications. Here, yeah, Rod Birch, Grove, Karui. Um, Dr. Soon, would you just, could you just make a comment on what countries of origin of grain um, being exported into Southeast Asia that you think are supporting their grain, grain products in terms of um, product development, milling and so forth in terms of uh, technical ex expertise and that and um, maybe where Australia is at the moment but particularly um, which companies and what are their organisations that are are giving that support? Mm. Okay, I think for anybody to use any product, they must know how to use it properly, right? I mean, if you could, you know, if I gave you a car and you didn't know how to drive an automatic car, then you know you, you you might have problems driving it, right? So I think to be able to use products properly is very important, right? And traditionally, um, the Asian meals have been using Australian wheat for noodles and general purpose and what have you, and the spring wheats for bread. Okay, this traditionally has been like this. And when the Australian wheat board was around, um, they used to you know, send millers to help them, and they also sent our millers to you know, milling you know, classes here. And of course, the objective is to make sure uh, like something like Prime Heart, which is extremely hard, Samolena, for those of you who know milling, I mean, you need a very strong uh, heat reduction rose, right? So, so you have to make sure your flow scheme seals the product. So that has been, I would say, useful. Uh, but whether it's useful today, uh, I'm not sure, because uh, most Asian mills have already been milling you know, um, Australian wheat. But there are a lot of new mills coming up in the last five years in Indonesia and many places. Now, those guys have not milled Australian wheat before. So I'm not sure what would happen if they went to the 
milling school in the US and Canada, whether you know, they would make their flow scheme more suitable for you know, North American wheat. So I, I'm sure that it will help, but how much, I can't, I'm not sure. But for traditionally, like in Malaysia, I think it's not, probably not going to be so useful. But for Vietnam, for you know, even China and you know, um, Indonesia and the countries which are like now Burma, you know, Myanmar, so they are building new mills. You, you really want their flow scheme to, you know, to, to be able to mill Australian wheat in an optimum way. Yeah, Dr. Soon, um, have you tried using uh, lupins as um, sprouts? Uh, that is one question. Sprouts. And sprouts. Sprouts, oh. but no, I've got another comment for you, and that is um, okay. I suspect if, if you guys were interested in offering us $500 a tonne for lupins, you'd probably get a consistent supply. Yeah, um, well, we have not used it for sprouts because um, I don't think sprouts are very popular. In, in Asia, you know, in Southeast Asia, we don't use a lot of spreads, yeah. But as far as supply demand is concerned, um, I think um, you're right. Of course, if there's demand, there'll be supply. But the problem is that Australian farmers, in my opinion, don't look at lupins as a main crop. They look at it as a rotation crop. If you could rotate with something like canola, which is selling at, you know, export value of about 550 today, I think you probably prefer to grow canola, then you to grow lupins. So uh, I, I believe that uh, unless it is grown as a main crop and there's a focus on it, um, I mean, it's not going to really work, is it? I mean, it's, they only grow it as a rotation crop. And I, I think that's where the main problem is.